you seem to uh, have uh, a lot of challenges for pure neuroscientists uh, trying to <laughs> make something with uh, factors. Uh, but uh, you, I in order to put the burden of, uh, on uh, the, the experimentalist, you have to uh, show that your own challenge can be uh, uh, deal with, co you can cope with. Uh, that is the challenge of uh, saying what are the proper uh, way of evaluating uh, aesthetic uh, uh, painting, for example. And, uh, uh, and, and what is not relevant normatively uh, for uh, art. And of course, it, it's a difficult challenge. Yes. I, I, I just want to clarify one thing. I'm not certainly in this paper, questioning the importance of work in neuroscience. So one of my concerns about this work is that in Ticini et al, it was an indirect argument for a claim about particular kinds of uh, neural events. And so a lot of my questions there were about whether we can actually support this claim by Friedberg and Galesi by doing work that is not itself work that involves carrying out fMRI studies. So I, that's why I was very interested and that's why I raised the questions I did about the work that's being done now to try and provide some kind of neuroscientific uh, proof of that. I mean, as to the question what counts as proper appreciation of a work, um, you're right, that's a very big question. It, it would be a very big answer as well, which fortunately you won't have to listen to. Um, but it clearly is the kind of question that I take it cannot itself be resolved empirically because it's a normative question. It's a question about proper appreciation. So the fact that people do respond in a certain way doesn't by itself settle whether that is the right way to appreciate an artwork. It may turn out that we will conclude that the way most people respond is the right way to appreciate an artwork. But I take it that uh, just like the question that um, I raised earlier and the one that I think comes up in the paper that uh, Vincent Bergeron and Dom raised, namely given that we have different responses under different circumstances, is one of these the appropriate kind of situation in which to engage with this work rather than the other one? You know, does it matter that I'm not seeing the performance of the work but just listening to it? Or does it matter that I am seeing the performance in the work and not just listening to it? And I think the answer to that question can't itself be given empirically. What, what we see empirically is a difference. And then the question is how do we weigh these different situations under which we have different responses? My point was only that in the history of art we have a kind of a pessimistic argument as in science. That is, uh, all the uh, way to uh, give a normative uh, explanation of what is uh, mm. relevant for art uh, have been uh, defeated by, uh, by artists uh, that mm. uh, invent uh, jet laboratories. So. That, that, that means we have to be more um, ingenious as philosophers and come up with ways of circumventing that, that objection. But you're right. It, it's... Um, I think the history of science is slightly more positive than the history of art on this, but, uh, but that neither of them is, is grounds for enthusiasm. Yeah. So quickly. Um, so just, I just wondered about this idea that, you know, the, the way that we do respond doesn't tell us anything about how we should respond. And I just wonder whether, I don't, I don't want to argue that that's, sort of wrong as you've stated it, but I wonder whether there's, there is a closer connection between how we do respond or, or uh, uh, the evidence that we have of a kind of natural and convergent tendency to respond and how we should respond than we would find in, say, ethical debate. So, you know, you... you the fact that people have tendencies to be dishonest in certain circumstances certainly yeah. doesn't <laughs> give you any reason at all for thinking that that's, that's the right way to respond. But when it comes to aesthetic responses, it, it, it kind of starts 
to me not to make sense in a way to say, well, I know that that's the way that we uh, tend to respond, but we ought to respond in some completely different way. Um, surely there has to be some pretty close connection between, you know, you can say, well, that's the way we are responding, but there are special circumstances which are making us respond in that way, and if they weren't, didn't apply, we'd, we'd respond in a different way. You could, you know, use those kind of special case arguments, but generally speaking, there ought to be a pretty close connection, didn't there? Well, obviously artists assume that by, I mean, come back to your example, by making marks on paper in certain ways, that respondents will respond in certain specific ways. So artists themselves assume that there are certain kinds of predictable regularities in the way that people respond, and they intend those responses. I don't want in any way to challenge that idea. But what I'm pointing to, I take it, and that's why I found the analogy with the paper by uh, Dom and Vincent Bergeron very illuminating, is that there are cases where there is clearly a difference in the ways in which certain respondents will respond to an artistic manifold that reflects some difference either in the priming they've had or some difference in the information they bring to that manifold. Um, so we have a difference in response, and the question is, well, which response is right? So what I'd resist there is the idea, well, let's do a poll count. If more people respond this way, then that's the right way. That can't be the right answer to that kind of question. So of course we have to assume um, that there are certain facts about the kinds of creatures we are, the psychology we have, the kinds of sensory apparatus we have, that determines that certain kinds of responses are, are going to be called for by certain manifolds. But sometimes different responses can occur according to what the receiver brings to the manifold. And that, it seems to me, is where we have to ask the normative question, which set of resources is the right set of resources? That's the only point that I was making. And it seems to me that that is an issue that's raised by this point about priming. Um, the fact that if I'm, uh, I mean, think, think of the example with dance, right? If I've been trained to dance in a certain way, then when I watch dancers executing that movement, if Calvo uh, Marino's work is right, then necessarily I will find myself engaged in, an, in a simulation of what they're doing, which will affect other ways in which I might respond to what's going on. Whereas somebody who doesn't have that training will simply be aware of the dance as a sort of artistically interesting manifold. And then you can say, well, so, is it in some sense spoiling my appreciation or enhancing my appreciation that I've got dance training? It seems to me that's a relevant question. Same question with film. People who've studied film, gone to film school, studied film for years, sometimes say, I just can't watch a film anymore. I just see the editing. I see all the, the, the mechanics. Well, does that mean they're better equipped to appreciate it or not so well equipped? And I'm just raising that general question. Yeah. And it's all it's exactly a, a follow-up on this comment. And thank you, I really liked your presentation. I, the, the field of neuroaesthetic is certainly in need for this kind of careful distinctions. Uh, and just exactly what you said, I can easily imagine a, the very, a drawing seen by two person. And one is completely naive, has a very low level experience in drawing, and is very impressed. He thinks that this drawing is beautiful and extremely well done. And the draftsman, because he has a much richer simulation, see that it's not so hard and it's quite easy to do, and he dislikes the drawing. So it's just <laughs> to question the, 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 the link that is made between simulation and appreciation. Maybe because th there are many work in. Uh, and the, uh, the interface between perception and action, which show like the work by Omel and colleague on the theory of event coding, which show that the relation between priming and activation of sensory motor re representation is much more complex than what is assumed here. So maybe I could imagine another hypothesis saying that the priming actually inhibit the city, interfere with the simulation of the gesture of the artist. And so the, uh, the subject which has done the, which has been primed with the congruent action uh, the, the process of making become a bit more mysterious because it's, the simulation is inhibited and this is why you like the painting more, st stuff like that. Like, like, there are many much thinner distinctions to be made. Yeah, it's I, mean, I mean, there's a paradox in a sense in the whole idea of properly appreciating an artwork. 
because on the one hand, um, an artist wants to produce some kind of effective response in an audio. Uh, in an audience, in receivers. So the manifold has been designed to affect us in certain ways. But on the other hand, when we think about what it is to appreciate an artwork as an artwork, the ways in which the artist has produced that effect in the audience is also crucial. So we need to appreciate that in order to appreciate the artistry in the artwork. So there's the danger that the more you become able to appreciate the artistry in the artwork, the less able you are to have the kind of response that the artist is calling for. So there's a tension here, and obviously what we have to do is, is try and be aware of that tension and not let it uh, affect us in our relationships to artworks. But I think we have to be aware that um, being trained in an art form changes the way you experience things in that art form. And that, I mean, the Calvin Marino I I uh, work is simply one example of that, and it's just obvious in other respects that's the case. Thanks, David. Um, so the preamble to your question suggests that you, you, you think that some artistic values are not achievement values. There are other ways to, mm -hmm. to realize artistic value. And the thing is that I can see that it's kind of setting the bar high. It's hard for to see how the results that were presented this morning mm -hmm. can tie to achievement value. It can be done, mm -hmm. but it will be a stretch, mm -hmm. right? It will be a stretch. But then why not say that, why not think that the results that were presented this morning pertain to some other kind of artistic value rather than achievement value? No, I, what it seemed to me, I mean, this is one way of, of trying to relate what was done to contemporary work in the philosophy of art on the relationship between factor and appreciation. So there is another way in which the affective response of the viewer can bear upon appreciation of the artwork other than through achievement value. Collingwood, right? So that's why I introduced Collingwood. Collingwood gives us one way of thinking about this where clearly my affective response, um, especially if that affective response reflects um, some kind of motor simulation whereby I, I see evidence of facture. For Collingwood, that's crucial. It's only through seeing evidence of facture that I can myself re-experience exactly what the artist experienced in producing those marks as the artist did. So if you've got a Collingwoodian view, then there's absolutely no problem with this idea. All I was claiming was that if you want to ask, how does this bear upon the ways in which a number of us, I mean, Greg, uh, myself, being, and Jerry being examples, a number of us have argued that artistic value has to include achievement value. Then one question is, well, how does this research bear on that claim, which I take to be a more plausible claim, myself, because I advocate it, um, uh, a more plausible claim about the ways in which the history of making of an artistic vehicle bears upon the appreciation of the resulting artwork. So if you've got that view, if you think the history of making bears on artistic appreciation because history of making bears upon artist's achievement, the point I was making here is that on that view it doesn't look as if the effective response that we might have to evidence of facture plays any part in artistic value. The only role that that awareness of factor will play is as evidence of a simulation, which is itself evidence that there is factor that we're detecting. And that will then bear on our reconstruction of what the artist's achievement is. And that can then be appreciated as part of the appreciation in the artwork. So it was, I, I wasn't suggesting that there aren't ways of thinking about artistic appreciation where the effective response to evidence of facture might play a key role in the appreciation of artworks. And I think that's what Collingwood offers us. That's why I introduced Collingwood, because I wanted these two models on the table. Does that, does that sort of, yeah? So, so there are three questions left. Yes. So it's, it's OK if, if, if the answers are not too long. OK. So Stephanie. Yes, no, and yes, respectively. Yes, yes, yes. No, yes. Well, I, yeah. uh, I have to say thank you. It's not on the time that we receive such a, such a, well, it's not on the time that we receive a philosophical review and such a philosophical review on top of that, so it's very insightful. Um, and there are, of course, many answers. And many, 
questions also that it raises, uh, but uh, we won't have time for this. Uh, only one or two things. Um, first thing, it's interesting to me to see how you consider uh, Calvo and Merino's work in comparison to ours, because to me there is a gap mm. um, between her work and ours in the sense that uh, on the contrary, yeah, what, what they did was indeed to measure the um, to, to, to present the action and to measure the reaction to this action, which is exactly what we did not want to do, mm -hmm. because it's interesting in neuroscience, what we consider is that it's the implicit measure that is more relevant than, than the explicit measure, mm -hmm. in the sense when if you, if you measure the consequence of a process, the activation related to it, but not the subjective part of it, so it is said that the measure is better determined. So, <coughs> so it's interesting to see mm. what philosophical objections you can make to this. So this um, is very insightful, I guess. And the other thing is the, which I find very very interesting is um, the what wh what we call liking or a, s a really sim simple response mm -hmm. that we we call um, the affective response, the subjective response, the subjective feeling in front of the paintings, how you can make it go to the, how do you call it, the, the, the artistic value, mm -hmm. wi which is something that um, we can't name and that is really interesting. It's definitely not, we're not yet approaching this concept yeah. in neuroscience and this is, um, very interesting to, to think of that. No, it was, it was a really interesting paper to work with, so I, I had, as, you, as I hope was clear, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. If you have time, because yes, it's, it's... Okay, just, just uh, a detail about one of, of your points, which is the, ex the experiment was made from photographs of the paintings and not paintings themselves. So on the one hand, I quite agree with you because obviously if you are to appreciate the way a, a work is made, it's crucial to see paintings and not reproduction, even high resolution ones. But on the other hand, I have to say that in the usual uh, viewing conditions in, in museums, we cannot appreciate it at all. And so I had um, a, a very fascinating experience about that. It was in Chicago about eight years ago. Um, the Chicago Ar um, Art Institute organized a private conference in front of the famous Seurat painting. And in, in front of us, they suddenly took off the protection glass. And so <laughs> we had a fascinating experience, quite different from one, w w what we saw with the protection glass. So I just wanted to say that even in a museum, <laughs> The viewing conditions are not enough to appreciate uh, factual. You're absolutely right. Yes. Uh, excuse me, can I yes. just say yes. because this is something I forgot exactly about this, is it's that the eyes are worse than a, than a, than a camera. And what, what we see, what we see is not the sum of the pro physical properties of the elements that mm. we see. The information is very much filtered, even at the perceptual level. And so it's, I mean, seeing seeing a painting through um, a through photograph or whatever is is different. I, I mean, it's it's worse than seeing it yeah. in in life. So it 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 doesn't. It wouldn't. I guess that I believe that it wouldn't make a huge difference in the scanner and in the experimentalization yeah. because it's very subjective at every level. So. Yeah, but but the, the things that we normally register when we respond to factor are aspects of the three-dimensional nature of the, the painting. Even I, I mean, except Magritte, of course, which is why I hate Magritte. But also the way in which the paint surface changes its appearance as we move in front of the painting. And those are crucial aspects of the way in which we register and respond emotionally to factual with paintings. So the concern was just that you lose both of those things. Whereas it seems to me in the case of the work by Calvo Marino, although what they're doing is looking at videos of people dancing, 
the relevant features of the bodily movements in order to trigger some kind of motor simulation are still there in the videos. So the worry was that you lose something absolutely crucial to the way we emotionally respond or effectively respond to facture when you photograph a painting. That, that, that was the worry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, when I see all your objections, whether one way out of it, and you probably won't agree with them, would be to say, well, what we really do with this experience is it's not testing artistic appreciation, but they teach us something about how pictures work, mm -hmm. namely uh, that there are ways of representing movement that no one ever thought of before. For example, not just showing someone running or, or in, uh, like in cinetic art, creating the illusion of, of movement in a still picture, but creating movement by a gesture. By, mm -hmm. and, and then it, stimu it even stimulates our motor activity, which really shows, wow, that someone, when Lessing says something like, when we see the Lao Kun moan, we can hear him screaming. You know, if we have activations of the sound zones, sorry, that's not the term, but uh, intermodal activations, uh, it can prove a thesis from the 18th century right, which seemed to be a totally introspective weirdo thesis, right? And these are very important contributions. And um, since, since Ramachandran, everyone is always about appreciation and can we understand why we like art? But I think there are many things that you're teaching us or that you could be teaching us that you don't really care about. It's sort of, so there are many questions that you answer in these experiments that are not those that you want to answer. And yeah, it's just to open up the... Mm -hmm. The, the question space, in a certain sense. I don't no, know. So, no, so, uh, just, just one minute more. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, if you decided. This yes. morning, this morning's uh, presentation of the last experiment. Yes. Yeah. So we have no affective response. Yes. You see, but we have uh, some premotor. Yeah. Fun. Uh, yeah. So, it's possible, possible, possible premotor pre -motor activation. Yeah. That's so why what, it's very what, interesting. What, no, so so it's, 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 it's a third case, yeah. you see, because you, you, you imagine the first case, you yeah. have affective response yeah, without yeah, imagery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And now we have uh, less uh, yeah. evidence for an affective response. Yeah. It's not the absence of affective response, it's weak evidence yeah. of an affective response, yeah. Yeah. but still we have an appearance, yeah. appearance of a uh, premotor with activation. Right. So it's, it's, it's a new scenario. What? That's, why, that's why I said this, you know, that that work, for me, is much more interesting. And I mean, I, I take very seriously the work that Calvo Marino and others have done on dance. So but how does it relate to how does it aesthetic relate? appreciation? Well, um, it, 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 it relates, I think, because independently of the effective dimension, um, what we are doing is registering through our motor simulations evidence of facture and if you think that the achievement value of a work is part of its artistic value, evidence of facture is something that goes into your attempts to reconstruct what the artist did, what the artist's achievement is and that bears on artistic value. So my worries are largely about the effective dimension in the earlier work. I think take that away, and I, I, I think the argument goes through, but it goes through as a claim about another way in which we have evidence of facture that enters into our appreciation of an artist's achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.